Hi everyone, welcome to week seven of the Navigating the Design to Manufacture journey series. I'm Abby Hurd, I'm from the manufacturing team at Knowledge Transfer Network and I'm joined by my co-host Ali McEnroy, Chief Exec at Product Design Scotland, who are partnering with us to bring you these lunchtime events. If you've joined us previously, you'll be aware that this series is set up to provide insights and opportunity to, to learn and explore and reflect on the challenges that, that people face when they're developing a hardware product, um, a physical product that requires manufacturing. So moving an idea into production is hard, it's challenging and it's, it's something that's really often underestimated. Only a, a minute proportion of physical products ever make it all the way through to scaled up manufacturing. To make this work, you need breadth and depth of knowledge and a balance between tenacity and flexibility. 97% of hardware products don't make it to scale. It, this, is, this is something that's really tough and part, part of that process, um, part of what we're looking at is uh, about IP. So from experience, this area of IP is something that which, which creates a sense of confusion and a little bit of false confidence sometimes. People can be so adamant and sure that Place, place their confidence in IP that's expensive, but they've not, not quite looked at the right thing. And it, sometimes it can even be quite damaging. Collaboration, we, we find, is something that's absolutely essential for developing hardware. So it's important to be able to share your ideas and the details of design. That's an integral part of the process. So understanding how you can do that safely and in a way that's conducive with innovation and ultimately allows you to realise your end goal um, is important. So yeah, an idea in your head that can't be realised is, is not, not the, the end objective. So um, ideas are valuable. It's important to understand IP and not be scared of it. So this session, we have some excellent speakers to help us talk through some important aspects of that journey. So we've got Ian Sterrett from the UK Intellectual Property Office. Ian's going to provide some context around the IP. Why do we have it? Stuff like that. Um, we've got Marta from Centella who's going to provide some detail on the ways that you can use IP to protect um, your, your design. And finally, Alison Orr from Ingot is going to share how we can unlock the value of the IP, how we can use it and make it work in practical ways for our business. So for now, I'm going to hand you over to my co-chair, Ali McEnroy, who will introduce our speakers and chair our Q&A panel session. Ali. Thanks, Abby, and uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, I'll just like to briefly add my welcome to that um, of uh, Abby's. Um, yeah, I can't quite believe we're on now week seven um, of this series. I reckon when uh, when this started, I naively felt like by week seven, we might be a lot further out of lockdown. So it shows you what I know about global pandemics, I guess. I, and to be honest, I don't know that much more um, about IP, but fortunately for all you guys at home, we have three um, speakers with us today who know a lot um, and who will help us guide, uh, guide us through some of the finer points of that and how it um, impacts on product development and design to manufacture over the next hour. Uh, so uh, my name is Ali McEnroy, I'm the Chief Exec at Technology Scotland, um, who among other things, um, are the home for Product Design Scotland, who are your co-hosts uh, for today. I'll be your chair for, for this part um, of the meeting um, so, and for the Q&A that will follow um, our three speakers. Just before I do pass on to our three speakers, just a quick bit of housekeeping. Um, we encourage you to um, submit your questions at any time uh, and please do so using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens. Um, please do use the Q&A box and, and not the chat box. Anything that filters into the chat box does tend to get lost in the overwhelming deluge of, of, of comments and, and, and things within that. So please do put it within the Q&A. It also helps us a lot if you could identify somewhere within your question who you're directing, uh, who you're directing it at, which one of our three panelists you're directing it at. Um, if there really isn't one in particular, then I'll pick on somebody at the end, but it does help just to um, to, to manage that um, as we get near the end. Okay, look, I think that is enough for me just now. So I'm going to pass you on to our first uh, speaker. It's Ian Sterrett, Policy Officer at the UK IPO, and he's going to talk to us about strategy and tactics for IP. 
So Ian, over to you. Yes, uh, thanks. Thanks, Ali. Um, let me just see if we can get this screen up and running for you. Hopefully you should all now see um, my presentation. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, my name is Ian Sterrett from the Intellectual Property Office. Uh, we're the official UK government body responsible for intellectual property rights. Um, I'm the uh, regional policy officer looking after business support based in Manchester. Um, my background is not as an IP legal attorney, but as an entrepreneur using the IP system. Um, I've been involved in startup and scale up businesses for the last 30 years, taking ideas, finding funding, building teams, launching new innovative and disruptive technologies. So very much uh, from the businesses side of the uh, side of the fence. Uh, okay, so in a talk about IP, we should start obviously with understanding why do IP rights exist in the first place? Um, <clears throat> intellectual property rights encourage investment in research and innovation. Uh, they reward regional design and branding and support all types of creativity. Uh, fundamentally, IP rights exist to incentivize innovation, to increase investment in creativity and knowledge, to boost productivity and stimulate and encourage innovation. Principally, we do this by ensuring that creators are the beneficiaries of their creativity. Uh, one of the best understood examples of this are, are, are quite often is patents. A patent is a commercial agreement between an inventor and the government which grants a commercial monopoly protected by law to an inventor. The inventor alone has the commercial rights to that invention for a period of 20 years uh, in order to encourage them in their invention. The good news is that the UK has one of the best IP regimes in the world, uh, consistently coming at the top of many different IP indexes. One of the best known, uh, just recently updated actually, is the US Chamber of Commerce, which uh, identified the UK as second best IP regime in the world. So a measure of economic activity is represented by the stock value of companies. Um, the S&P 500 is the index of the largest UK, oh, sorry, US companies. Um, and if you look back to 1975, 83% of their value could be attributed to what was classified by the accountants as tangible assets. By 2015, that picture had dramatically changed. From the mid 1990s, the impact of the knowledge economy starts to accelerate the importance of intangible assets. So in, in 2004, uh, two academics from Stanford University called Walter Powell and Kaysa Snellman said, the key component of a knowledge economy is a greater reliance on intellectual capabilities than on physical inputs or natural resources. So the knowledge economy means the ability of the human mind to be creative, to inventing new solutions, improved solutions, ensuring increased functionality, usefulness and value, design, knowing what to make is at the core of innovation, progress, economic development, social, environmental improvement. It includes things like the Internet of Things, the use of sensors and data control manufacturing processes, Industry 4.0, the development of software, artificial intelligence, 3D printing to remove cost, waste and time between concept and physical object. Over half of the intangible assets identified here are protectable by one form or other of registrable intellectual property right. It could be said that the remainder can be covered by unregistered intellectual property rights such as trade secrets and know-how. Another view of this knowledge-based economy <clears throat> comes from looking at where companies make critical investment decisions, i.e. where they spend real money. So in the UK, investment in knowledge assets outweighs that in physical ones. In 2014, UK market sector invested an estimated 132 billion in knowledge assets compared to 121 billion in tangible assets. So although UK companies are now built on their intellectual 
rather than physical assets, too many miss the opportunities to fully realize the potential of their IP and too few have the knowledge and skills to develop value and exploit their IP. So there's a heck of a lot to go after guys. So let's take things from the macroeconomic to the microeconomic level. And how much do you see this as a theoretical scenario? So an inventor approaches a major company to explain their innovation, to their invention, clearly in the expectation that they would adopt, that that company would adopt uh, and commercially negotiate the use of the invention. And they're told, thanks, not interested. Then when the inventor leaves, the company consider how to do it themselves. so that they can gain from all the commercial benefits. As an innovator, can you imagine not, how can you manage not to be frozen out in such a situation? At the early stage, it's mainly about securing income, having IP that makes you different from your competition and that genuinely, and is genuinely specific to you so that some larger player can't claim that they've got prior rights to what you're doing. Having an IP regime in place creates the conditions where the majority of potential collaborators will respect your IP and seek to work with you in good faith. So let's be practical. You started with a great idea, an invention, a new manufacturing method, whatever the creative difference, the value you've created, what happens next? To achieve widespread adoption, you will now need money, a way to manufacture and a route to market. The right investment can be secured if you have a good business model, which addresses the other two issues on this list. So decisions, options for how you will manufacture. Are you gonna build a complete factory or are you looking to leverage others that have such a capability already? For it to market, are you going to hire your own sales force with the right contract contacts and sector knowledge or find a commercial partner? <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> In finding collaborators, business partners, you will be exploring and negotiating what you can do, who brings what value. The more sound the foundation of your idea, the ownership, the stronger and clearer will be the definition of your value and the importance and influence of your position in those discussions. So this slide covers the breadth of impact IP can have in any commercial negotiations. First of all, are you certain of the uniqueness of your creativity, that it hasn't been done before? If you know the market for your solution, you may already have good intelligence, but a good resource for research in the uniqueness of your sales proposition can be found in the patent or trademark registers. If you already have registered IP, it inspires respect and confidence, gives credibility to your marketing. An IP strategy is a plan to sustain your competitive position. IP helps as the foundation to negotiating franchise or licensing deals. And investors know IP often is the core value of any exit, trade, sale, or measuring acquisition activity. So what is the value of intellectual property? Although an intangible asset, IP rights can be bought and sold, licensed to third parties, mortgaged, just like tangible assets. Your core basis to building partnerships on the design to manufacture journey. Key message is IP should not primarily be a legal issue, it's a commercial issue. The exploit pay, your exploitation plan should direct your protection actions. So you've got a patent, now what? A patent's not the destination, it has to be applied and exploited. How do you plan to do that? So I'll pass over to Marta and she can now pick up on some of the different types of uh, uh, intellectual property, uh, some of the issues associated with it. Over to you, Martha. Thank you. Um, let me see. Sorry, just 
just one second until I manage to share my screen. It worked before everybody was online. <laughs> <laughs> it will, it will. Can you see my slide now? Yes, perfect. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you, Ian, for the for introduction and for this excellent presentation, which leads directly into my slides. Uh, my name is Marta Guarisco. I'm, I'm Italian, as you can probably tell from my accent, so I apologize in advance if I mispronounce anything. Please let me know at the end if anything wasn't clear. Um, I work as a patent scientist for Centilla IP, which is a patent and trademark attorney firm based in Glasgow. I'm not gonna spend much time talking about uh, Centilla because I only have 10 minutes to go through all the different forms of IP protection. But I just want to point out that we are not lawyers. We are people with um, physics and engineering degrees. And in particular at Centilla, we have a team focused on electronic software and mechanical engineering. So when I thought about how to go through <laughs> five or six different forms of IP protection in 10 minutes, I said perhaps the best way to do it is by taking a real product. Because one of the uh, things that we tend to notice quite often, especially with uh, people who are at their first invention, is that sometimes you tend to focus on one form of IP and neglect others. So I decided to look at this, which is, as most of you probably know, an Apple Watch, and think of all the forms of protection that I could use to, to, to protect it. Just uh, a month ago, I read on Forbes that Apple had just obtained protection for a new feature that they plan to implement in the Apple Watch, which is a camera placed in the wristband so that the user is um, capable of rotating the wristband around and taking pictures from different angles without having to, to twist their arm. And this is just one of the many patents that Apple has been applying for in relation to the Apple Watch. I ran a super quick search on the patent database uh, looking for patents assigned to Apple with watch in the title. And since 2014, they have more than 20 patent applications, some of which are, are already granted. For example, they've applied for uh, protection for um, face recognition. They applied protection for, for protection for a modular watch where the user can implement sensors after buying the watch. And they've also applied for protection for a sensor which is able to determine the orientation of the user arm. So this is just to say that just one single product can actually have multiple patents connected to it. But what can patents do for you in general? First of all, patents uh, give you the right to prevent others from doing certain things in relation to your invention, such as making the invention, using it, offering it for sale, importing, selling it. Patents are territorial, so they are only able to give you protection for the jurisdiction where you have filed for a patent application, if it's granted, and they only last for up to 20 years. What can you protect with patents? You can protect technical inventions which are new, and new means everything that is not being publicly disclosed before the filing date of your patent application. This includes also your own disclosures. So it is of the utmost importance that you do not publicly disclose your invention before filing if you intend to seek patent protection. And the invention must be non-obvious, so it has to have an inventive step. It is um, quite well known, I think, that you can protect products, but also processes. So for example, you could protect a manufacturing process. You could also protect different uses of a product. Uh, perhaps what is not as well known is what you cannot protect, which is uh, listed in the Patent Act, but it's only a, a partial list. And this includes mathematical methods, mental processes, and methods of doing business just to list a few. An alternative route, if you cannot seek patent protection, say because your invention only provides um, a minor improvement which does not satisfy the inventive step requirement, is to um, go with uh, utility models. 
which is not available in the UK, but it's useful to keep in mind if you're looking for protection abroad. There are a number of European countries uh, that uh, allow protection for utility models here, sometimes called type patents. The difference is that uh, there is no inventive step requirement, or if there is, it's lower than for patents. And you can quite often get a, a much cheaper and faster um, route to grant. However, the protection is weaker compared to that of a patent. But it can be useful. For example, by running another quick search, I did find uh, some examples of utility patents for the Apple Watch, such as this one, which is a utility patents filed in China for uh, the outer case of the Apple Watch. So it's something to keep in mind. Now, going back to the Apple Watch, the other thing that jumps to the eye immediately is probably the design of the watch. So I'm going to spend just a couple of slides talking about design. I repeated the same exercise as I did for the patents, looking on the design database. And I found a couple of examples, but there are, I'm sure, many, many more. So you can see here they try to, they, they are protecting the, the wristband of the watch, the, the, the part which is not um, protected, his mark with this, um, can't find the word, uninterrupted lines. And here they have another design registration for a, a different type of wristband. So again, the same product can actually have multiple design registrations. One thing that people may perhaps do not know is that you can also file design registrations for graphical user interfaces. Um, Patently Apple, which is this website of uh, Apple fanatics that monitor all intellectual property from Apple, um, just posted uh, not long ago that Apple was able to obtain 44 different design patents in Hong Kong for their user interface elements. So again, it's something to keep in mind. Talking about designs in general, what can they do for you? Designs, they protect the appearance of products. So for example, lines, shapes, and colors, but do not forget that this is not only for the tangible products, it's also for graphical user interfaces. They um, can only be registered if the design is new and has individual characters. So again, new means that it must be not have been publicly disclosed before the filing date. So if you intend to, to file for design registration, you absolutely must not disclose. However, there is a grace period, which apologies, which uh, varies from country to country. So for example, in the UK, you are able to file a design registration uh, up to 12 months after the first disclosure, but it's better not to rely on grace periods because if then you want to file abroad, you may not be able to, to obtain registration in different territories. Design can be renewed for up to 25 years, uh, and they can also be protected by unregistered rights. However, unregistered rights are only valid for up to three years from the first disclosure, and it is harder to enforce them because in order to prove infringement, you would have to prove that there was copying. So it is probably better if you have a very valuable design to protect you with registered rights. Going back to the watch, um, another form of IP protection that is available is trademarks. So this is related to the brand that you use to, to market your watch. Again, I went to the trademark database um, and I, I ran a quick search restricted to the UK. And I did find a couple of trademarks for watch in, uh, which are valid in, in the UK. For example, this one is a trademark for the word Apple Watch and it's registered in a bunch of different classes for a lot of different products. And then another trademark here for a logo, um, which is valid uh, worldwide. This is the code of, um, of, of an international application and which is registered in class 14 for uh, a, a number of watch related products. So what can you do with trademarks? Trademarks are a badge of origin, which means they are used to distinguish your goods and services from the goods and services of another uh, undertaking. They are typically words, sounds, logos, or colors, and, but, but they can be also a combination of these. And recently there have been quite a few original uh, trademark registrations that have used position marks or gesture marks 
So there, there, there's various things you can do with trademark. Unlike patents, they can be renewed indefinitely. However, they're also territorial. If you want to pursue trademark protection, you can, uh, in, in multiple countries, you can um, exploit different international rules that are available. Um, again, trademark must, must be distinctive and non-descriptive and they undergo a strict examination. So one thing to keep in mind is that if your trademark is too similar to that of another business for the same goods and services, it's likely to be not registrable because it will not be distinctive. So when you, um, when you launch a new business or a new product, one thing to keep in mind is, is your trademark actually free to use or will you arrive at the point where you want to register and then find out that you can actually not register because you didn't do a proper, a proper search at the beginning. So it's always useful to do at least a very basic search just by going on the trademark database, same as I did, and try to, to look for the brand that you intend to use. Back again to the watch. One thing that is perhaps less noticeable is that the watch also enjoys some copyright protection. Copyright tends to be associated mostly with literary work, songs, and artwork, but uh, one thing most people perhaps don't think about is that software, databases, manuals, websites, they can also fall within, within these categories. So it's something that you should always keep in mind. Unlike patents, designs, and trademarks, you do not need to register copyright in the UK in order to enjoy protection because uh, copyright arises automatically at the act of creation. However, do keep in mind that copyright belongs to the author in the first instance, so unless the author is an employee, you may need to assign copyright to your business in order to be the legal owner. And then just to touch on one last point, um, I wanna spend a couple of minutes talking about trade secrets, which uh, could be a very valuable route in, if you would not pursue patent protection. For example, if your invention cannot be reverse engineered, um, trade secrets might be a good alternative because patent protection require you to disclose your, your invention when you file the application. And the application then gets published normally 18 months after the filing date. So you may, you may not find much value in, in protecting your, uh, your invention with a patent if you know that you will not be able to enforce it because it cannot actually be reverse engineered or if you have to disclose um, technical know-how, which is very valuable to your business. In that case, you may use trade secrets, which of course is uh, information which is kept confidential. However, two things to be kept in mind, trade secrets only qualify as trade secrets from a legal point of view, if they have commercial values because they're kept secret, and if you can demonstrate that you have put in place reasonable steps to keep them secret. So, to conclude, looking at the Apple Watch, an example of trade secrets could be the algorithm behind the apps that are connected to the watch or all the technical and commercial know-how that has been um, deployed to develop the watch. I know I'm already over time, but just to give a quick conclusion, the, the most important thing, I guess, out of this slides is that you should always keep in mind that there are multiple forms of protection and you should from the start try and think which one is the most suitable, which one or which ones are suitable to protect your invention, your, your products. If you intend to seek patents or design protection, it is absolutely necessary that you do not disclose your invention before you file for registration or for patent protection. It is always useful to do at least some basic searching before investing a lot, whether in a branding strategy or in the development of a product, because you don't want to find out too late in the, the process that you've actually been spending a lot of money for a brand that is not available or for a product that is not actually patentable when your only point maybe was to get a patent. And here, just for your future reference, I've posted a few links that may be useful to you and our contact details if you would like to get in touch. Thank you.
Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Marta. Um, and uh, just before we move on to Alison, just going to put on the I see a lot of you have found your way to the Q&A panel, which is great. Um, so please do keep those questions coming in for our panellists. We'll, we'll aggregate them all and ask them at the end of this session. Uh, and now uh, on to our final speaker, who is Alison. Over to you, Alison. Thanks, Alistair. Um, I presume you can see my, my screen okay. Hopefully somebody will nod at me. Great, lovely. Uh, hello everybody, uh, my name is Alison Orr and I'm from a company called Ingot Limited. Um, i just spend uh, one minute just to very quickly introduce the company so you have a little bit more awareness. Um, uh, just uh, travelling around the UK, I'm based in North Yorkshire uh, on a lovely sunny day, so um, uh, despite the accent, just to confuse everybody. So, uh, uh, but Ingot um, was created really um, to try and sort of help companies harness their IP value. And the way that we do that is really around uh, three things, some online tools um, around uh, identifying your intellectual property and wider intangible assets, and also um, a management tool and also a valuation tool. And uh, those sort of three tools have been really um, important to help uh, companies in particular in the valuation side to identify and uncover over about 730 million pounds of hidden IP value. The company works internationally, in particular in Asia, we're working places like Singapore, Malaysia and Thailand. And we do offer other uh, services um, over and above our uh, online affordable tools, um, things like IP audits, technology evaluation, bespoke reports and also training. So for example, we deliver on master classes and accelerators and you'll see some of the people that we work with, including the UK Intellect Property Office on their master class, give them a plug. It's a really good uh, master class um, for further information. And obviously there's a lot of um, um, for the business support around in the UK, but also dealing with a lot of financial institutions as well, as you can see in, in view of our tools and obviously directly with companies. Um, and just uh, at the end of this, um, if you feel that you have the need for some further bedtime reading, we also are involved in quite a lot of uh, influential industry reports, so a little bit of a selection there that you can find on our, our website, uh, www.ingot.com. So just a, a little bit of a, a feel for, for what we get up to. So um, we've obviously heard from Ian and Marta in terms of um, you know, what these in intangible assets are, this sort of intellectual property, what's, what it's all about. And um, you know, one of the, the key things that we need to try and obviously get across, although these are intangible assets, as, as Ian has, has mentioned already, you know, um, just like tangible assets, you can do a lot of things with them. You can use them, you can share them, you can license them, you um, can even mortgage them. But unfortunately, we're not necessarily that um, well placed at um, understanding what we have. And if you don't know what you have, you can't obviously exploit that fully. So to move on to... Um, a bit of an idea in terms of how IP can create value. So Ian mentioned um, an Ocean Tomo report, which um, suggests more than 84% of value in sort of the standard and poor 500 companies are attributed to implied intangible assets. So there's a lot of value sitting within your companies. You know, that it can be even at quite early stage, you might be quite um, it's surprised at how you can utilise um, your intellectual property to obviously uh, create value and often a case that might be the only value that's in your company as, you, as you're um, at early stage and working on it. So in terms of um, this sort of direct way and direct income, um, if you manage it well from a very early stage, as we see right from, from the beginning, um, so sort of early stage through to a mature stage, um, you can obviously um, create a direct income and it might be because you've got IP that makes you sort of different from your competition, it's specific to you um, and you can actually utilise that whether or not it's registered rights and you can in theory stop someone and um, get moving into your space, you know it could be a larger player um, and just utilising obviously those prior rights in terms of what you can and can't do and creating value from that. It's providing you know the activity to restrict the competitor activities in particular with registered rights or you're able to make something that no one else can make um, and get it out there quickly or use your brand actually for that matter. It's not all about patents and um, so you know it's just that you've got a brand that no one else can use if you, you're protected by way of a registered right and all of these things help you of course to um, give you hopefully you know freedom to operate and help you to sell your products and services 
There's also going to be indirect ways that you can um, use your IP to create value um, and, you know, maybe not quite as an early stage, you know, because you'll have been trading for a little bit. Um, but it could be, for example, you've got a website and um, it's becoming quite popular. You've been selling products on there and people want to actually pay you money to advertise on that website. So it's not related directly to the products that you're ser uh, selling and the IP that you're, um, that's on that website, but it's an indirect way of that sort of, uh, sort of exposure that you've created and uh, you know, directing people to, to your website. So you can get people to pay you money to, to advertise, for example. It could also be trading value. So that as you move on and obviously and start to become known for your offering um, in terms of a particular product or service, you can start to barter with it. So um, it's that ability to share um, or swap or translate. So it might be something along the lines of you build a website for someone and they help you to create a new logo, a design for that logo, for example. So it's the old fashioned trading. Um, and that's, you know, on a micro level, but also with IP it can happen on a much larger scale. So it could be that you have to have some sort of cross license with a larger company that has some sort of core technology, but you've created an improvement uh, on that core technology. So um, there's also um, things happening at sort of the, the sort of wider uh, level and sort of larger companies. Of course, as you start to grow, we're in this sort of growth uh, phase, hopefully becoming more profitable if you're managing your IP well. Um, the IP is absolutely fundamental to your profitability. It's helping you deliver things that other people can't. Um, you know, it's creating loyalty with your customers, it's locking the customers in, etc. You know, we're hearing, um, uh, Marta mentioned about companies like Apple, so they've obviously developed quite a following um, for, you know, different reasons. You know, it could be just the design. A lot of people like the design of the products, but it also could be just uh, in terms of the operating system, so you're kind of locked in and it's, it's difficult to change from those sort of systems. Moving on, ideally, um, this is the kind of a holy grail that we can actually use our IP to leverage funding and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But you know, there is a possibility for IP to be used um, to, as security. It happens more in the US, but it's, you know, starting to happen elsewhere in the world. Um, you know, there's companies, if anyone's had, you know, got kids or had kids, there's a company called Mind Candy, which developed a uh, a little online children's um, zoo called Moshi Monsters and they had a lot of um, intangible assets in particular around their registered trademarks worldwide and they used that if you look in companies house they used that in terms of um, securing uh, loans and um, they're in a little bit of trouble at the moment because of the um, software that they use they were sort of linked to a uh, flash player which is, is uh, no longer around but it is possible and that's certainly the space that Ingot works in Absolutely, as you start to grow more strongly, you've got licensing opportunities, you've got franchising opportunities. So to touch on franchising, for example, we've got companies like Costa Coffee, McDonald's, they've developed a strong brand, they've developed strong systems, that's all intangible assets, they've just, um, got things like trading operations, um, recipes, the business models, that's all going to be the basis of um, the franchise. The hook is going to be their trademark at the top um, and strong franchise agreements are going to be um, key to ensure that the quality and reputation of these core assets are, are maintained. So you've got to be careful in terms of the contracts that are in place there. But this is, this is a really good way of obviously monetizing your IP. And of course, as you move on, influence and reputational value, of course, that's a bit of a, a no-brainer, in particular if you're showcasing and showing a company that you're spending a lot of money on new developments and obviously also the health and safety aspects and safety of products. And last but not least, we've got funding. Um, at each stage, different stages, there's a really strong connection between IP and equity funding, potential investors want to de-risk their investments. They want to see, ideally, some sort of registered rights and you're managing that portfolio well. And um, you know, all of these things happen at each stage of development. And it's really important, just you know, if anything you take away from this, to try and get it right as early a stage as you can, because high, having IP doesn't only limit you to from getting income directly, but also indirectly, as you can see. 
So that's a whistle stop tour of some ways to, to sort of realise the value, but there's also other ways as well. As I say, I've mentioned um, it could be things like an exit, um, buying or selling companies, raising funds for growth, but also it could be things like paying less tax. So if you have a granted um, UK patent or a granted European patent that designates the UK, you can get a reduced rate of corporation tax. You can also, if you're developing uh, and you're working in innovation, you could be a creative company. It's not all about technology or, you know, really, um, and thinking about patents all the time that are tax relief stairs. And that's all about your IP. Um, and finally, you know, some, some ways is um, there's some really neat studies by the European Patent Office and the European Intellectual Property Office um, just to show how much money IP intensive industries bring. And so it's about 81% of the EU's world trade, for example. And also those that are managing their IP well are 10% more likely to have overseas turnover. So um, it's really important. Um, licensing in just a little bit more uh, detail, I'll hopefully um, uh, talk a little bit more here, but I wanted to just very quickly, and apologies for the speeds, but to uh, give you an idea of obviously traditional asset-led strategy. This is all about knowledge transfer in terms of a way of monetizing um, your, your IP. So um, some typical business strategies from a company's, you know, what, starting off domestically and also looking to internationalize historically you would make the, the goods yourself and you would sell directly to your customers whether at home or overseas but more often than not and looking at apple for example that marta used and um, they may be creating ip but they may not be manufacturing it directly and getting to customers directly they may be working with third parties. So there's huge opportunity here um, to take advantage of all of these different strategies in terms of monetizing, you know, he, of course, managing it appropriately is understandable ownership who, who, you know, setting out your, um, your contracts, ensuring that the ownership is clear because working with third parties can cause a few uh, issues if you don't if you don't uh, do that that well. But um, that's a sort of traditional way versus um, a sort of more um, up to date way perhaps and using the opportunities globalization. And just to give you a little bit of an example is a little company for example <clears throat> here where um, for example they're a small company they've been manufacturing air conditioning units and they've created a new air filter that's got some sort of enhanced properties for removing pollutants in the air. Now, this is maybe an area that's a little bit different to what they were used to doing, but this filter you know, has been proven to have some great features and it's novel and inventive. So the company might decide that you know, they'll, they'll just sell the filters themselves, they'll put it in their own devices, or they'll actually, um, sell the filters only to, to other companies. However, as you'll see, there's other ways of monetizing this. They could actually utilize licenses um, to actually get it into different markets and get to get it in um, geographies and also in different uses. Because, you know, the filter could be used for other applications. It could be healthcare, but that would require some sort of um, medical device testing and certification. And, you know, there's, it could even be, you know, large um, data centers like Amazon, for example, they need to remove pollutants as well as the heat from the air, I guess, and all of those big data um, centers. So it's looking at your business model and hopefully when you're a bit further down the line, um, you, you will see opportunities of actually maximizing the value of your IP. Or it might just be that that IP becomes, you know, to, to a point that you're not wanting to focus on it anymore. You might want to sell it or license it out to others that are working in that space. So there's, there's different opportunities, um, as I say, to, to monetize that IP. But at the heart of all of this, in terms of unlocking your IP value, is really understanding what you have. And just coming back to some key points to take away, is understanding exactly what you have. And as well as obviously what we've discussed, working with professional advisors, people at UKIPO um, and other business uh, help. There's a little tool that we have called Gold Seems Free that I would certainly advise you to have a look at in terms of understanding what registered rights you have and the wider intangible assets. Also understanding that 
a lot of the problems is that you don't see a value of these intangibles on your balance sheet and immediately people perhaps don't take it as seriously as they should. But it has to be understood that there's strict rules on how you actually um, obviously have, have that showing in your, your balance sheet. So there's regulations in place that you have to show a value um, for identifiable and tangible assets, for example, and goodwill as well as your tangible assets. Um, but that's only got done at cost. And ideally, if your IP is unique, it will be worth a lot more than what it costs to develop. And just to be aware that um, there are ways of valuing IP. I'm not going to go into them in detail, of course, today, unfortunately. Cost, obviously, is one. Um, um, market valuation is the one that we would really like to use because, you know, but like tangible assets like houses and cars, it would be nice to do it that way. However, there's just not this, the information uh, out there and also IP is unique. However, it's a useful tool of just, you know, getting a feel for the value um, in that space. And the final one, income methodology, that's used by one of the INGOT tools I was talking about online. And it's the most widely used internationally as it calculates what the present value of any future cash flows is attributed to the assets. And it's the most relevant because it's really the motivation for any transaction because it's normally benefiting from that future value. And our tools are all about standardising this process and obviously the reason that we work um, very closely with the banks. So there's a time and a place to when val IP valuation has to be done. Um, it could be post um, also um, if you're doing sort of transfer pricing. But there's also times when it's actually just a good thing to do as part of your business strategy and how you can utilise it. So we've got lots of case studies in terms of how companies have used it to obtain uh, finance, raise finance, going into licence negotiations, etc. So just to be aware that there's um, you know, more information out there and it's just to give you a little bit of a flavour of the ways that you use valuation and a little further reading um, that Ingot was involved in with the UK and like what we um, if you have seek help you know work with your professional advisors business advisors um, and other networks and um, utilize the Ingot Gold Scene tool it's there it's free please uh, have a look at that it's really important to understand what you have try and link it in with your typical business plan. If you're doing market research, you should also be using the patent and trademark databases. They're free. There's a huge amount of information there. So utilize that to help you to understand where you should put your uh, uh, intellectual property. Check that you're mitigating risk, keeping an eye out for infringement, ensuring your employees as you grow your business are not utilising um, copyright images, things like that on the website that they shouldn't be. There's all sorts of things that you can do. And obviously look as you, you grow of ways of monetizing that IP. So overall, just please do ask questions. And obviously there's, a, there's an awful lot of information and assistance out there in the UK on all of this. So it'd be great if you can take advantage of that. Um, coordinate everything with your business strategy and speak it. A very quick um, plug, not to end in a downer, but if anyone is in trouble and thinking of using, um, a, a trying to um, apply for a loan under C-bills, um, we do have free access to our valuation tool, which can be helpful for that application. So just wanted to flag and obviously be aware on our website, there's some more information. But thank you very much for sticking with us on a whistle stop tour that everybody's going through and um, hopefully we might be able to help answer some questions. That's brilliant. Thanks, Alison. And thanks to all three of our speakers um, uh, today. A huge amount of information there for for people to absorb at home and it has generated perhaps unsurprisingly a huge number of questions as well I've been trying in vain to kind of keep on top of them. Clearly we're not going to have time to go through them all uh, today but you should be able to see in the Q&A that our panellists have very kindly started answering some of those directly anyway. Uh, we will also make sure that any questions that aren't answered we will get to our panellists and we will provide them with answers um, as, they, uh, as they are given. Um, Okay, look, so I'm going to crack on with the questions in, in the interest of time. So first one, I'm going to come to you first, Ian, if that's okay. 
Um, and I'm, I'm sort of aggregating a few questions here, but there's been a number of questions around, I guess, the, the balance between the, the, the protection of IP and the, the money and resource that may be required to do that against other business functions, I guess, R&D, marketing, sales, that kind of thing. So if you get any tips for how to find that balance and perhaps by extension, any ways of providing protection without necessarily breaking the bank. Um, yeah, probably one of the most common uh, dilemmas that, uh, that a startup business is actually faced with. Um, you know, the one thing you, you have got loads of is ideas. The one thing you don't have very much of is money. So, you know, should you be spending your viable monies to, 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 to you know, register various IP, etc. One of the things that people quite often don't appreciate is, you know, the, the five different types of IP that Marta covered. Not all of them actually cost an awful lot of money. For sure, patents, you know, one of the gold standards is quite expensive to, to uh, you know, apply for patents and secure patents. But when you look at some of the other types of IP, something like trademarks, you know, it's possible to register a trademark for less than 200 quid directly with the IPO. Um, designs, you know, you can register individual designs for 70 quid uh, ago for a particular sort of category. And then when you look at copyright and trade secrets, there is no such thing as paying to register a trade secret. There is no such thing as having to register copyright in the UK. Both of those types of IP, you automatically own straight away by creating them. So the real trick is to know which of those five types might be the most appropriate and be able to, to, uh, to have an overall sort of strategy as to which ones you're going to try and rely on at different phases. There's nothing to stop you. Um, one of the really good examples of, 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 a, of a good patent strategy I came across was a, a, a company that was developing a, a medical device. And the guys behind that company had worked in medical devices for a good 20 years. They knew how critical it was to own patents to have credibility, but they knew they were in the start phase and they didn't have any money. So what they did is they hired the salespeople to go out and, and create lead applications and deliberately did not patent the first version of the actual device because they didn't have funds to do it. And as soon as they started getting market feedback and they got the first sales coming in, then they patented the later versions of the actual design when they did have monies available at that stage. So it's a case of being appropriate at the right time relative to what your overall business uh, decisions are that you're taking you know ip yes you, you know the more protection you can get the more valuable the more credible in negotiations but it always is a balance as to what you know how much you spend on that versus what you need to spend money on elsewhere so uh, does that hopefully that answers <laughs> <laughs> well, it was quite a broad question so i appreciate you answering it in the space of a couple of minutes so I think, um, I think that was excellent. Thanks very much. Um, another question that's come up um, a couple of times in various forms, and I'm going to put this to you, Marta, if that's okay, um, was around this idea of, of public disclosure, I guess, and, and what defines that, and whether we're talking about general public here or whether there is a, a there is scope to to share these ideas, etc., with third parties. I'm thinking about things like invent, uh, investors, things like that. So, is it a how do we balance that? I guess. So. So to answer one specific question, disclosure to a third party can be done under NDA, so under an non-disclosure agreement. In that case, it would be a confidential communication. It would not be a public disclosure. The issue may be when a third party, say a large manufacturer, is not comfortable signing an NDA agreement. Because maybe, maybe a manufacturer is worried that the idea you want to disclose to them is something they have already been working on. So not always it's possible to convince the other party to sign an NDA. But in that case, there are steps that you can take to, to, to make yourself more comfortable with, with the idea of disclosing the, the invention to a third party, such as instead of disclosing the whole thing, you can disclose just enough to, to test the interest of the other parties, but not enough to make it an enabling disclosure, which means somebody will not be able to reproduce the invention with what you have disclosed alone. So as long as you do not disclose all of it, then it will not straight away kill your chances to patent the invention. Okay, brilliant. Cheers, Martha. Uh, we are running a, a, a little bit short, but just time for um, a quick question towards 
uh, Alison. I'm not actually sure if I'm necessarily directing you, Alison, but it came in as you were speaking, so we're going to go um, um, to you with it. I guess kind of a two-parter. And the question was based around this idea of, of having an, an, an innovative idea. Is it possible to protect that before building any actual hardware uh, and testing? And then also an extension of that sort of is, um, what are the rules around publishing uh, anything to, to do with that around testing or the development of that hardware in relation to, to IP protection? Yeah, so that one was, was safe for me. I, I guess um, as Marta was obviously talking about um, in terms of protecting it. So if, if there, there's software and hardware, I think that you mentioned there. Um, I mean, for the patent application, she explained, you know, it has to be novel inventive, it has to be an enabling disclosure. So it's all about timing and it is very, very dif difficult. You want to try and potentially um, go for a register or protection as early as you can. But if you, in particular with patenting, if it's too early, then that's obviously costs can start to kick in a bit quicker. And, uh, you know, when you're an early stage company, the funding is a problem. Um, so there has to be a balance between having the enabling disclosure for the purpose of the patent application um, and also weighing up, obviously, with um, you know, the costs and being able to, to afford those, get the funding in, to spend in the time uh, to go out and obviously to the marketplace. Also understanding the best way of protecting it. You know, if it's software, it was explained, you know, that it's software in theory is not patentable, but, you know, if it has a technical effect, there's the potential it could be. Um, it really depends, and again, this is where you would link it into your business strategy, is how important that is uh, to, to your company going forward. Do you need to protect it by way of a patent? Would that be helpful? It might be that you actually start to go down the patent route just for the purpose of investment. And once you get that investment, hopefully the investor might take on the patent cost, or it may actually be dropped. Remember, you've got the 12-month period in patenting to obviously make some more commercial and inquiries um, and also it will not be published until 18 months so there might be an opportunity to withdraw and re refile you know that's that's an, again an opportunity but it's not necessarily something you would um you would, you would recommend but it's it's a tricky one and i think you know coming back to ian it's just having a means of capturing a sort of strategy capturing what you're doing how that obviously links into your business strategy and what you decide to take forward in terms of how you protect it if it's registered rights. There may be ways of keeping it as a trade secret. And if you do that, just as important as a bit of time and effort taken to actually understand the new, the trademark directive that you have to show it, you know, keep it confidential, take reasonable steps to keep it confidential. And that can be as, as simple as just having something behind, you know, a locked door, a bit like the Coca-Cola recipe or having password protected documents or you know things like that so it's just lots of uh, tips and that's again hopefully they can take a little bit for the advice from the relevant advisor okay brilliant that's that's great and, and, and thank you uh, and for, for your answers and, and thank you as well all three of our speakers for uh, another excellent uh, panel session thank you guys as well at home in your uh, living rooms gardens bedrooms wherever you are for your engagement we've been flooded with questions again uh, for that reason, we haven't got around to answering nearly all of them. I do direct you to the Q&A um, panel because there have been answers given to a lot of these questions by our panellists already. And as I say, we will try and get to those who asked additional questions. We will try and get those in front of our panellists one way or another to supply you with an answer. But yeah, so thanks again. Uh, that's it for the Q&A part. I'm going to just pass you back now to Abby to close off the session. Okay, over to you, Abby. Thanks, Ali. Yeah. Thanks to all our speakers and thanks for um, such engaging uh, questions. We've definitely got loads that we, we didn't quite manage to get to, but we can send those on to our speakers and we can follow up with that afterwards, potentially. Um, yeah, just to share a little bit of detail about upcoming events. Next week, we've got a, a great event on funding and investment. This is, this is a big question that comes up all the time. So I think we'll get real insight into what investors are looking for, what the funding landscape looks like. I think often there's an impression that there's not enough funding out there, whereas actually um, the reverse can be argued. Um, so yeah, next week will be a great session. After that, we've got another four events in the series. Um, but before that, on the, on the 5th of June, we've got this extra event. So we've got an interview with Hacks. Um, mentor Alan Clayton, who hacks are a, a hardware-based um, 
Accelerator Programme and they offer $250,000 of funding and three to six months of intense support um, across offices in China and uh, San Francisco. Um, and they take people right through to, to scaling up manufacturing. So they, they're like one of the leading programs in the world. And we're going to speak to this mentor, Alex Clayton, who's been with Hacks since they started in 2012. And he's seen around 250 uh, hardware startups through this process. So he'll have some really great insights to share. Um, after that, we've got yeah the, the last four events in the series. So one on risk regulation and standards, one on building supply chains, networking and collaborating and design thinking and systems principles to finish off. So in addition to all this, we're hoping to do a brokerage event. And if you've got other stuff that you'd like to see us doing to help you with collaborating, please get in touch, let us know um, what, what would be helpful to you. And we will we'll take that feedback on board and consider what we can do with it. So thanks, thanks all for joining us today and for your participation. Thank you folks. Thank you. Thank you.